welcome. Let's look at the cell. The cell is the smallest indivisible part of the human body, which means that it is the smallest unit that cannot be divided. Let's follow with this lecture to understand the anatomy of the cell. Let's go back to the basic, knowing that two or more cells in the body will come together to form tissue, and two or more tissue come together to form an organ, two or more organs come together to form the entire human body. So going back to the cell, it means that the cell is the smallest unit of the human body. So this lecture will be focusing on the cell to describe the anatomy and structures that are contained within it. The cell is the basic structural and functional unit of life. So this is the configuration of what a cell looks like. The cell is capable of living an independent life, which means that within the cell, we have different organelles that are capable of undergoing or performing different functions, just as we have the digestive system, the respiratory system in the human body. So also we have different organelles that are responsible for performing this function. So they are capable of living their own life with the organelles performing the different functions that they need for them to be able to sustain living. The basic structure of cell is that we have protecting or limiting boundary that is called the cell membrane. So this is the cell membrane highlighted in black. This is a membrane that tends to surround the entire cell. And within this boundary, we have the region that is called the cytoplasm. Within the cytoplasm, we have different organelles located within it. And these organelles are suspended in a fluid medium that is called the cytosol. Let's look at this chart of structural component of cell. Cell is made up of two basic structures, which include the cell membrane and the cell cytoplasm. The cell cytoplasm is further divided into the cytosol and the cell organelles. The cell organelles are structures that are embedded within the cytosome. The cell organelles are also further subdivided into membrane-bound organelles and non-membrane-bound organelles. The membrane-bound organelles are organelles that are surrounded by membrane, while the non-membranous organelles lack structural boundary that is called the cell membrane. Let's look at the cell membrane. We say that the cell membrane forms boundary of the cell. So it forms like a limit of the entire cellular configuration. It is also referred to as a plasma membrane or the cytoplasmic membrane. This is the cell membrane highlighted in black. So this marks like the limit of the cell. What is the function of this cell membrane? Apart from creating boundary or limit for the cell, it also helps to separate the intracellular region from the extracellular region. We have region outside this cellular configuration, and these are called the extracellular compartment. So it tends to like form a boundary between the intracellular compartment and the extracellular compartment, so that structures cannot just move to and fro. There is going to be like a boundary or a barricade created between them. It also helps to protect against invasion or attack of foreign bodies. So organisms that are dangerous will not be able to penetrate into the cell due to this boundary that is created. So they do not have free access to go into the cell to attack the cell. It helps to control movement of molecules. So molecules are not just allowed to move freely to and fro the intracellular and extracellular compartment, as we've said. So there's going to be a control. And when some molecules are needed in the extracellular compartment, it is going to be released by the process of exocytosis. And also when substances are needed within the intracellular compartment, it is going to move through endocytosis. So there are specific processes that will be initiated when the need arises for movement of molecules to move to and fro the intracellular and the extracellular compartment. So there's no free will because of the creation of the cell membrane. So there's going to be a form of control of movement in this regard. Also, they are involved in a number of cellular processes, which include cellular adhesion, ion channel conductance, and also cell signaling. In cell adhesion, cells are able to form adhesion with one another if the need arises. It is onto the cell membrane that cell is able to connect or attach to the other through structural proteins. And this is seen during the formation of epithelium 
which is a collection of two or more cells seen lining the interiors of cavities or lining surfaces. They also allow ion channel conductance. This is seen mostly in cardiac muscle where there's a need for the transmission of ionic impulses so that ions are able to move from one cell to the other through the cell membrane. And also cell signaling. This is exhibited in nerve cell where there is a need for the transportation of neural impulses and signaling from one cell to the other. The cytoplasm, we've said that the cytoplasm is the entire configuration of the intracellular compartment. And the cytoplasm is thus enclosed by the cell membrane. So within the cytoplasm, we have two substructures. We have the cytosol, which is the liquid medium that is seen within the intracellular compartment. The cytosol is like a mini river into which the cell organelles are suspended. So this is the cytosol. And the second structure that is seen within the cytoplasm are cell organelles. And these are the cell organelles which are suspended into the cytosol. So the two basic structures will come together to form the cytoplasm. So the cytosol, the cytosol, we say that is a fluid that is seen within the intracellular compartment. This fluid is jelly-like and also colorless, and it's mainly composed of water, salt, ions, and proteins. What's the function of this cytosol? The cytosol helps to hold the organelles in place, so it acts to keep them in position. It also helps to maintain the shape of the cell. The cytosol also helps to prevent the collision of the cell organelles. We have cell organelles suspended within the cytosol, so the cytosol helps to keep them in position, thereby preventing them from colliding with one another, which can tend to destroy their structural configuration. It's also a means of transportation. Like it's able to allow movement of substances from one region to the other. It also acts as a storage medium. So substances are stored within the cytosol, but are enclosed within a vacuum. It's also a medium for bowel reaction. Cell organelles. Cell organelles are also referred to as little organs or small organs because they tend to perform specific function they are also specific in terms of structure. They are specifically designed and they undergo specific function. And the function that they exhibit tally with the relationship with the organs and the body. As the organs is to the body, so also the organelles is to the cell. So the different organs that we have in the body are specific in structure and also they perform specific function. And this help in the survival of existence. So also in cell, these organelles are structurally distinct and also tends to perform specific function. And the function that they perform also allow the cell to be able to live an independent life. And these organelles also vary within the cellular compartment. They vary in terms of number. Some are one in some cell, while in others, they are more than one. They can be two or more, depending on the function of this cell. They also vary in terms of the function that the cell perform and also the location of the cell. So let's take the cell organelles and see what they present in terms of their structure and also their function. So cell organelles, we've said that they are divided into two subclass. We have the membranous organelles, which are organelles that are enclosed by membranes. And we have non-membranous organelles, which are organelles that lack a protective covering that is called the membrane. So talking about membranous organelles, these organelles we've said are bounded by membrane and the kind of membrane that they are enclosed with is like the cell membrane that we have enclosing the entire configuration of the cell. These membranous organelles are usually more in number than the membranous organelles. So you see just a few non-membranous organelles where the number of membranous organelles are usually seen to be more. And we have a list of membranous organelles. We have the nucleus, we have the endoplasmic reticulum, the Goga apparatus, the mitochondria, the lysosome, and the vacuoles. So we'll be looking at these structures one after the other to see what their structure is, to see their morphology and also the functions that they exhibit. So let's take the nucleus first. The nucleus is a centrally placed membranous cell organelles, and this is the nucleus of the cell. What the nucleus does is that it creates accommodation sites for genetic material. Within the nucleus, we see thread-like structure that is referred to as 
chromosomes, and these chromosomes are responsible for the transmission of genetic information from one generation to the other. Let's play a little bit around nucleus. For most cells, they are seen to have one nucleus and also other cell organelles. And this is the general presentation of what eukaryotic cells are. They have a nucleus and they have a number of cell organelles. There are some cells that do not have nucleus and they are referred to as a nucleated cell. Examples of these cells are the prokaryotic cell. The prokaryotic cell, a very good example is the bacteria. The bacteria does not have a nucleus and their genetic material that is supposed to be enclosed within the nucleus is not seen in the cytoplasm. So this is what the bacteria present. The mature red blood cell in human also are a nucleated cell. They do not have nucleus because we know that the red blood cell are responsible for the transportation of hemoglobin. So they tend to displace their nucleus so as to create more space for carrying hemoglobin. So some cells do not have nucleus. We also have multinucleated cell, which means that they have more than one nucleus. That is, they have two or more nuclei. And this kind of cells, a very good example are the liver cells, the muscle cells, and the osteoclast. And they are also referred to as polynuclear cells. The structure of the nucleus. The nucleus structurally is seen to be a double-layered structure. So they have two layers. We have the inner layer, and this is the inner layer. Then we have the outer layer, and this is the outer layer. Within the two layers, we have spaces created. And these spaces are called nuclear pores. And this is the nuclear pores. And it is through this space that structures are able to move from the nucleus into the cytoplasm. So there are times where structures will need to move to and fro and this space is so created to allow that. Also to add that the outer layer of the nucleus, which tends to be continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is the rough endoplasmic reticulum studded with ribosome. And you see that the outer layer of the nucleus is seen to be continuous with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is to allow passage of the ribosome produced in the nucleus to pass through the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it will be packaged. Because further processing of the ribosome will occur in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And in order to create a space for its passage, it needs to be continuous with the outer layer of the nucleus. And that is why it is also closely seen to be located close to the nucleus. So that as soon as production of ribosome occur in the nucleus, it will be directed through the nuclear pores to pass through the rough endoplasmic reticulum for it to be further processed and packaged. Within the nucleus, we have three main structures. We have the nucleoplasm. The nucleoplasm is a viscous liquid that is seen within the nucleus. And this is the nucleoplasm. We have structures suspended within it, and this include the chromosomes. This is the chromosomes. The chromosomes are thread-like structure that's are made up of proteins and DNA strands. These are responsible for the transmission of genetic information. And this is where it is located. And the last structure that we see within the nucleus are the nucleolus. And this is the nucleolus. So for the nucleolus, it's the largest structure that is seen within the nucleus. We've said that it is located within the nucleus. And what the nucleus does is that it's responsible for the production of ribosome. And this ribosome, after production, are thereby transported out into the cytoplasm. And they go through the nuclear pores where they are directed into the rough endoplasmic reticulum, where it will be further processed and also packaged. So we can say now that the function of the nucleus will now be for protein synthesis. And it does this through ribosome production after which it is transported out of the nucleus for further processing. The endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum are a continuous network of highly coiled branched tubular membrane. They are of two types. We have the rough endoplasmic reticulum and we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. From the name, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is studded with ribosome. So you see that the surface appears to be rough 
because of the patches of ribosomes that are deposited on the surface, why the smooth and the plasmic reticulum appears to be smooth because it is not seen with deposit of ribosome. So let's look at the rough and the plasmic reticulum. The rough and the plasmic reticulum is also referred to as the granular and the plasmic reticulum because it's seen with ribosome granules on the surface. And this tends to provide a pathway through which the ribosome producing the nucleus, as we've said before, enters through the rough and the plasmic reticulum where it is further processed and packaged. The rough and the plasmic reticulum does a non-membranous packaging for the ribosome, and that is why it is seen to be naked on the surface of the rough and the plasmic reticulum and also within the cytoplasm. And that is the rough and the plasmic reticulum. As you can see, the surface is studded with ribosome. And of course, we said that the gross presentation of the rough and the plasmic reticulum is branched. They are highly coiled and tubular kind of membrane. This tends to give a large surface area for them to process this ribosome. Because of this extensive branch network, they tend to provide a structural support for the internal compartment of the cell because of this extensive branched or coiled tubular membranous network that they present. But the smooth and the plasmic reticulum is also referred to as the A granular and the plasmic reticulum. Just as the name implies, A granular, it's devoid of granules, which in this case, it means ribosomes. So they are smooth, they are not seen with ribosome deposits, and this is what they look like. You see them, they are plain and not rough as seen in the rough and the plasmic reticulum. The smooth and the plasmic reticulum is responsible for lipids and, and carbohydrate synthesis. Because they have the same configuration as the rough and the plasmic reticulum, the only difference is that they are not studded with ribosome. So it also tends to give an increased surface area for the synthesis of lipids and also carbohydrates because they are highly coiled and branched. So it tends to increase the surface area for the activities that they perform. Also provide internal structural framework for the cell. The Gogai apparatus, like a mini packaging factory that helps to package substances within the cell. This is the Gogai apparatus and it is located close to the endoplasmic reticulum. And what the Gogai apparatus does is that it packages substances, but the kind of packaging that it gives are membranous packaging. So after assembling them together, it also provides a kind of boundary, which is a membranous covering for these substances. And this is what the Goga apparatus does. So when substances are needed to be transported out of the cell, they'll need to pass through the Goga apparatus for it to give a membranous packaging for these substances so that they can be well transported out of the cell. So structurally, what they look like, they are flat layered sac-like structure. They have two surfaces. We have the cis surface and the trans surface. This is the cis surface. The cis surface is the surface through which the substance that is needed to be packaged will pass through to enter into the configuration of the Goga apparatus. And when it goes down, it enters and it exits the Goga apparatus through the trans surface. So after the trans surface, we see that the substance is now being bounded by a membrane before they are finally exported out of the cell. The lysosome. The lysosome is another membrane-bound organelle. And what they contain are degradative or digestive enzymes. These enzymes are highly acidic and they help to digest or destroy foreign bodies. So this is what they look like. You can see enzyme within a membrane-bound structure. So this is the lysosome. So the membrane that encycles these enzymes tends to break off or rupture when they see foreign body or unwanted substances that are needed to be digested. So when this rupture, they release their content and their contents attack the substance or the structure that is needed to be destroyed. To justify the membrane bound necessity of the lysosome, is that it helps to control the rate at which structures are digested or destroyed. Because if it is not membrane bound, it means the content will be floating all over the cytoplasm and it can destroy structures 
that are wanted or needed for the survival of this cell and even go as far as damaging the structural configuration of other cell organelles. So it needs to be membrane bound. And this membrane will only rupture when the need arises, when they see foreign bodies or wanted substances that are needed to be digested. This is the relevance of the lysosome being membrane bound. Then we have the vacuoles. The vacuoles are also membrane bound cell organelles. These are basically like a storage unit, store molecules that the cell need like nutrients and food substances so that when they are needed to be used up in the cell, they will be taken off and be used by the cell to carry out their metabolic activities. The mitochondria, the mitochondria is like the powerhouse of the cell. It's the most important cell organelles because it provides energy for the cell in terms of ATP. There are activities that the cell undergo that they need energy to execute. And it is the mitochondria that is responsible for the production of this energy so that the cell can be able to undergo different cellular processes that they need for survival. So also hard that some cell lack mitochondria, like the red blood cell, the mature red blood cell tried to create internal space for hemoglobin that it transports. And that is the reason why it's lacked this organelle so as to be able to create space to carry more hemoglobin. Also because the red blood cell, we know that it carries oxyhemoglobin. It's also lack mitochondria so as to prevent the use of the oxygen that it is carrying. Because if it contains mitochondria, it's going to use up the oxygen. Whereas some other type of cell in the body have more number of mitochondria because of the cellular processes that they undergo. So they need more energy to carry out or to execute those activities. And a very good example is the liver cell. So let's go to the structure of the mitochondria. What does it look like? The mitochondria is made up of two layers. We have the outer layer. This is the outer layer. The outer layer appears to be smooth. Then we have the inner layer that appears to be convoluted. So this is the inner layer. You can see that the inner layer is thrown into folds. This fold is referred to as the cristae. And within the inner compartment or the inner layer of the mitochondria, we have the space that is referred to as the mattress. The mattress is filled up with enzymes that it uses to produce energy. And the energy, of course, is produced in terms of adenosine triphosphate or ATP. Looking at the internal layer of the mitochondria, we say that the internal layer is thrown into fold. Being thrown into fold is to allow or to increase the surface area for the production of ATP. So going to the non-membranous organelles, remember that when we started this lecture, we already said that the membranous organelles are more than the non-membranous organelles. The non-membranous organelles, as the name implies, means that they are not membrane bound. So they are seen floating naked within the cytoplasm. And we have two, we have the ribosome and we have the cytoskeleton. So let's look at the ribosome. The ribosome are like molecular machines that are seen floating freely in the cytoplasm. You see the ribosome on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and that is where the name is being drafted from, being rough because it's studded with ribosome granules. And you also see them floating freely within the cytoplasm. So this is the ribosome within the cytoplasm, and we also have the ribosome on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The production of protein is needed within the cell because they help to repair damage areas or regions within the cell. And they're also involved in different cellular processes, which include endocytosis, exocytosis, and also cell adhesion processes. The cytoskeleton are filamentous structures or network that is seen within the internal configuration of the cell. And what they do is that they help to maintain the shape of the cell. They also help in movement and also in cell division. So we'll be looking at the different types of the cytoskeleton that we have within the cell. So let's look at the different types that we have. We have the microfilament. This is the microfilament. The microfilament are the tiniest. They are the most abundant. And what they are involved in is movement and also help to maintain the shape of the cell. We have the intermediate filament. And the intermediate filament is slightly larger in size than the microfilament. And this is what they look like. They are highlighted in green. 
They are also involved in maintaining the shape of the cell and also help to enhance movement. Then the third cytoskeleton that we have is the microtubules. From the name, they are small tubules. They look like a tube, and this is what they have. They are also involved in movement and also maintaining the shape, and are also particularly involved in cell division. Also, let's look at the surface of the cell. Cell surface are also being transformed into a number of structures that helps to enhance the function that they undergo. The first one we'll look at is the microvilli. The microvilli are finger-like extension that is seen on the surface of the cell. And this is the microvilli. You can see the finger-like extension that is seen on the surface of the cell. And what they do is to help increase the surface area for the activity that this cell performs. Whether this cell is involved in secretion or absorption, it helps to increase the rate at which they secrete substances. And also, if it's involved in absorption, it will help to increase the rate at which they will absorb substances. Because if we cut out this region and you stretch it out and cut out a plain region that is not seen to be folded, this will present a longer length than a plain region. So it tends to increase the surface area for the activities that they exhibit. Then we also have another form of transformation seen on the surface of the cell, and this is the cilia. The cilia are air like projection, and this is what they look like. They appear to be longer and narrower than what you see in microvilli. And what they do is the transportation of molecules of fluid along the luminous surface of the organs that this cell is lining. What they do basically is to hate transportation within the luminal surface. So this structure tends to flip forward and backward. As they are doing this flipping movement, they help to push what is contained within the lumen of the structure that this cell is lining. Then the third form is the flagella. The flagella lash-like attachment that is responsible solely for movement. And this is what they look like. It's just a single extension and it appears to be very long. It is longer than the microvilli and the cilia. And what they do is to help propel or enhance the movement of this cell. Where you see this kind of expression on the surface of the cell is the bacteria, or you see them in sperm cell. Then applied anatomy, we have cell culture. Cell culture is a process by which a cell is nurtured outside its normal environment. We know the natural environment of cell is within the human body system. Then when it is taken out and cultured outside in the lab, it is called cell culture. And the aim of this is to get the best yield of cell so as to improve life and providing solution and treatment for problems at hand. Then let's look at cell death. And when cell die, they die through two patterns. They either die through necrosis. Necrosis is a sudden cell death. So when cell die suddenly as a result of infection, toxin, injury or radiation, it is called necrosis. But when it is programmed, it means this cell death is programmed to happen. When cell die and it's programmed to happen, it is called apoptosis. This is usually seen during the developmental process. Let's use this illustration here. Let's say we have this space. Uh, this rectangular field is where we have cellular deposition. But the structure that is needed to be formed is this pattern marked white. It means that all this region outside, the region marked white, the cell would need to be programmed to die so that you can have the presentation of this structure that is highlighted in white. And that is our developmental process occur. Cell will be programmed to die so that organs will be structurally molded. So that is a program type of death that occur during the development of form. Also, we have cancerous cells, and this is when cells continuously divide uncontrollably and they will become malignant. When they are malignant, it means if they have the capacity to spread to the neighboring organs or structure, then they are cancerous. But when they divide uncontrollably and they do not have the capacity to spread to the neighboring structure, they are benign. When they are benign, they are not cancerous. But when they have the capacity to spread, becomes cancerous. And this can occur as a result of genetic influence, lifestyle infection, radiation, toxins, and so on. And basic treatment would be chemotherapy, 
radiation treatment option or surgery as the case may be. So let's go through this exercise. What is cell? So we should be able to describe what cell is going through this lecture. And the second question will be to describe the structures of cell that enhance its ability to live an independent life. So thanks for watching.